And then behind the rats or alongside the rats, there were other really interesting young talents emerging. The radiators from space tend to lay claim to having had the first punk rock single in Ireland, which was um, television screen, which got into the top 10, I think. With a shifting musical landscape, the time now was right for a new rock and roll magazine, and one that might actually have a chance of surviving. The first issue of Hot Press appeared in May of this year. It's one of a range of youth publications, some from the underground, some alternatives to the national press, some simply aiming at capturing a youth market commercially. At the time, there was perception with Irish publications that didn't have to measure up to international magazines, but our thinking was we're going to do something that's very professional. People are going to buy it because it's, it's, it's good rather than because it's Irish. The magazines that have existed in the past have been considered by musicians for a start and by presumably any, any thinking person to be little more than a joke. I liked names and I liked words. I thought Hot Press was smart. But because Stokes was behind it, I just didn't believe, you know, that this was going to be viable. I thought it was going to be some bloody hippie thing again. And we had to leave that behind. Ireland was love check shirts and long hair and, you know, that was the look. But I thought the name was cool. I remember seeing the first edition and, and it was unmistakably Irish in the sense that Rory Gallagher was on the front. There's all these pictures of different iconography of Ireland. You know, some of it political, some of it musical, some, you know, and, and there was a sense like that for the first time something was really good in that area from Ireland. The writers were really good, Niall Stokes himself, Bill Graham. So that was very striking, and that it wasn't amateur hour, it wasn't some kind of bunch of show band heads. The other magazines at, at the time of the Hot Press's launch and development were really very few and far between. There was um, In Dublin magazine, which was kind of obviously just Dublin. We had McGill magazine, which is more ostensibly political. The main newspapers were really quite traditional. The Irish Times would be the one that would be most covering kind of high culture and, and uh, books, opera, whatever, the arts. So the difference with Hot Press, and, and this must be emphasised, was that it had a connection to the world of, like, Rock music, like let's get away from the punk thing, even before that, what was coming out of America and Britain, the, the 1970s rock scene, right from the hippies, right through the 70s, that was an important international language. And really, we could plug into that by buying records, but in terms of documenting it as a, as a native publication, Hot Press did that. And it also inspired us to form our own bands and our own fanzines. So this is a bunch of them here. This is me and some of my punk friends outside Advanced Records in the Dandelion Market. You, you see the way fanzine culture was very much DIY. This is Zilch. I think this is from Dundalk. Tremendous activity around the country, not just in Dublin, but also Cork, Dundalk, and Belfast had a very strong punk new wave scene. And these things were only had a certain reach. At the end of the day, to find out what was happening nationally, we would still be reading the hot press. Punk rock, described variously as avant-garde or the music of despair, is a prime interest at the moment to readers of hot press. A critic from Hot Press is present as the punk group Revolver performs at the project in Dublin. In a couple of issues, I wrote my first album review, went back to journalism college to do a second year. And after a couple of months, Niall said, you know, if, if you weren't in college, we might have been able to create a job for you. And I went, well, if you told me you were going to be able to create a job for me, I wouldn't have gone back to college. So I bade farewell to Rathmines and to the academic career and joined up with this mad, new, chaotic little magazine that was just getting off the ground. Yeah, I think he shared very strongly the philosophy of Hot Press. It connected with what he felt about the world. He loved the fact that there was a platform there for people to express themselves. You know, people could uh, write 5,000, 7,000 or 10,000 words even if that was what was needed to tell the story. Um, and so it was, an, it was a, a, a natural home for him. It might sound a, a little bit grandiose, but it was a writer's paper or a creative person's paper. It wasn't just writers. As I said, there were illustrators and photographers and people like that of real talent who cut their teeth there. But so many journalists who have now made their names in in Irish mainstream journalism and other areas, cut their teeth in hot press, and De Declan was one of them. 
At just 17 years of age, Declan Lynch suddenly got the idea of writing a review and sending it into Hot Press. I went to a gig on a Saturday night in Belfield, a Louis Stewart gig, and I'd, I'd admired Louis Stewart just as a, because he was a, evidently a great musician, although jazz wasn't really my, my thing. I just got this notion at the gig of writing about it, because, you know, punk rock and all these things had started raging outside, right? You know, the, the Sex Pistols had arrived, and here in Belfield on a Saturday night, Louis Stewart was playing this, this lovely kind of sophisticated music, but the drummer, who was a very great drummer, but his greatness was overshadowed for me by the fact that he was smoking a pipe. <laughs> the piece was delivered, you know, A4 pages, about eight of them or whatever, but I read it and immediately I knew, knew this guy is a real writer. And what he had done was something I'd not seen anyone else do before. I mean, most people would treat this idea of sub submitting a review quite an earnest sort of thing. So they'd write very seriously about one album or one artist or something. But Declan just decided to write up this Louis Stewart review as though he was writing a review of the Ramones. And the piece was absolutely hysterical. And then a couple of weeks later, I get my hot press as usual, and there's this article. It, it was just an amazing moment for me, you know, that uh, I had no anticipation of this. I had no sense that even received the thing. And yet they'd received it and published it. And it was kind of one of the main live reviews. The justice for Louis Stewart is that all these years later, I'm forced to actually read it. To be honest, I don't think I've ever got over the shock of that. And there were people who, who would tell me it's been downhill ever since. Despite this burning enthusiasm, most of the staff at Hot Press were severely underskilled. I had a bit of typing and shorthand skill from my first year in Rathmines in the college, and this was regarded as manna from heaven in the Hot Press office where everybody was writing out their copy long-handed and uh, nobody had shorthand and you know, very few people typed. So it was a learning on the job gig, that's the way it worked. And we did, and we learned fast. Well, I mean, the copy, first of all, had to come in. You know, it would often be late, and then it had to be typeset. So somebody was downstairs, then you had this stuff called Letraset, which nobody's heard of nowadays. And you did the, the headlines on the, on the paper one by one, and then you'd lay them down like that. To proofread and correct copy literally involved taking a scalpel and cutting out an individual word and sticking it over the mistyped word. So if you look at the headlines from the early issues of Hot Press, where you think, yeah, yeah, I can read that all right, but if you look close, you think, that's not really a, a letter P, is it? We didn't really notice who the previous tenants were because they were quiet and you know, went about their business. Hot Press ran about their business, but all, all the newsprint used to rub off on the wall as they were coming down the stairs. And, and I complained about that a number of times and didn't stop it. As we went in uh, the main door every day, we would see the list of clients of Murnaghan solicitors. It was like these serious people are here trying to run the world properly, while the rest of us were kind of running up the stairs with a hangover, having done an interview with, with someone that we, we forgot to put batteries in the tape recorder for. It seemed to kind of emphasize to us the, the rackety nature of, of our existence. And yet somehow we kind of felt ultimately what we were doing was actually more important. But yeah, this was this is where all the mad late nights would have happened. And I remember there was occasions when, you know, we had music playing here and we'd people bring in records and they'd be kind of part of the buzz would be, you know, everyone wanted to get the particular favourite album of uh, favourite album at the moment played while we were working away. And uh, yeah. then there were occasions when we opened up the windows, stuck the speakers outside and treated <laughs> the, the, the general public to a blast of yeah, the Ramones yeah. or the Sex Pistols or whoever it was at the time. So. Niall and Maureen had a great uh, way of kind of bringing people with them. Very late at night, you know, you'd be really flagging and instant coffee was, not, was banned in the office. It was real coffee and she'd make the really strongest stuff about three or four in the morning and then we had a little record player and she'd get the, the Sex Pistols <laughs> and the Sex Pistols album, she'd put that on, you know. And, and I was, every time I hear that riff of God Save the Queen, I always think of that time, you know. Ah, oh, now we've got to go, we've ten more pages to lay out, or whatever. This is 
where the queue used to be here. And the queue up here for the box office. You got your ticket there, it's closed up now. Even journalists had to pay in in those days. No freebies. Yeah. Exactly the same. This is where the women used to be up here. And the men would be over here. And the crush would be in here in the middle. But I suppose because of those horse lips would be a bit more civilized. So there'd be sort of people would be sitting cross-legged on the floor and things like that. It was actually only some months later after Hot Press started, I kind of got this idea that I would just write a review and see what happened and send it in. And lo and behold, it was actually published. But I had no idea how to follow it up. I had no idea what, what did you do? Like, communications were nothing like they are now. I mean, I was down the west of Ireland. I didn't have access to a phone. If I wanted to make a call to Dublin, I had to go around all the shops collecting five penny pieces for the coin box. And, you know, you had a limited time to get through and to speak to somebody. And then I had a couple of pieces published in the next couple of years. But I, well, I had less and less success. And I decided I would actually write one last review, you know, and type it up and have it perfect. And then that would be it. And I remember doing this review of Bagatelle in Longford and ran out the next week to get hot press, certain that it was going to be in. I wasn't. There was a review of Bagatelle by Bill Graham in Dublin or something. And I was completely devastated. And I actually gave up then. I said, that's it. You know, it's not to be. It's not going to happen. This was my uh, day job back then, back in the late 70s. I was a railway clerk uh, here in uh, the goods office in Westport Station. It's funny enough, it's uh, the sim a similar building actually to the dance hall in Balladrine. They're both good stores, but I spent two years here, uh, which looking back on my life, those two years, they now seem like 20 years in my life. Several months passed, and then out of the blue, I got this letter from Lyle Stokes saying, listen, that was a really good review. We couldn't use it because Bill had done this, but uh, you know, it was, we'd like you to do some more stuff. And that was how I started. I mean, and I had given up. I mean, I'd, I'd stopped trying, which is quite a salutary lesson, really. I'll tell you, something about working in a goods office anyway, in CIE in those days, that would give you enormous motivation to get the hell out of it. 